Get out the insurance cards, get out the co-pays. The office is open, my friends. Brought to you by DrRoto.com. What is up and welcome into another off-season edition. We are the one and done show. We are your fast break of college basketball information. I am Eric Romoff. You can catch me on those Twitter streets at Fantasy Nav. And he is the captain of our ship, the the arbiter of our big board, none other than Mr. Mike Holland. Mike, how's it going tonight? It's going good, man. I'm excited to finally have the entire transfer portal set. Um, you know, we're just kind of waiting on some news here from the NBA draft, uh, see what players kind of keep their names in. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, obviously go to drroto.com. You can see our top 100 there. A lot of decisions being made. Um, and yeah, just excited to see where we kind of go from here as teams kind of take shape. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, we have the columnist for the Omaha World Herald joining us today. Uh, so Dirk Chatlin, appreciate you coming by to chat with us a little bit about some Creighton hoops. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. It's an exciting time of year. It, it certainly is, and, and especially for this, this Creighton program, right? We start with the, the huge news last Tuesday, the uh, the, the top-ranked transfer, I think he was number two on Mike's big board, Baylor Shireman, made his decision for the Creighton Blue Jays. I guess, uh, Dirk, maybe kind of walk us through this process a little bit. What, what were your thoughts when the news dropped? Um, you know, how did this unfold? How did he come out to his decision to join Creighton? Well, uh, Baylor Shireman has, uh, I think, been on the, the transfer portal you know, radar for about two years now, uh, since he sort of emerged as a, as a really jack of all trades, um, you know, sort of versatile one through four, almost at South Dakota state. Uh, they won 30 games this year. They went undefeated in the summit league. And I think the question was just going to be, is he, is he going to be willing to, uh, to make the jump, to put his name out there and see what happens. And, uh, I think he's he's considering the NBA still. Uh, I think that's you know an option that if he gets positive feedback, I think he would still be interested in in going that route. But more likely is is that he's going to go to Creighton. And I think the big reason one, it's it's home. Uh, it's it's about two hours from his hometown in Aurora, Nebraska. Um, but even more than that, I think it's Creighton's. It's their style of play and and sort of what they have coming back. I mean, it's. It's just a tailor-made situation for Baylor Shireman. He can give them lots of different things. He's uh, he can be the knockdown shooter that they need. He can be, you know, play some point guard. Uh, he can be a clutch scorer. He can even be a rebounder for them. Play small ball four. So uh, it's a really exciting development for Creighton, and I think it's it's exciting for Baylor too because, uh, as you guys know from watching him, he's he's really a, uh, he's really kind of a showman. And I think he deserves the big stage. And I think Creighton and the Big East is going to give him that big stage. Yeah, you, you hit it right on the head. I mean, he's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, I think for a lot of people, you know, really the only exposure they got to his game, uh, just for the casual fan, was in the big dance when he put on the show against a tough Providence team. Uh, so, you know, you followed his career from the high school ranks. Can you tell us what kind of player the Blue Jays are getting? Well, it's funny. Uh, I first watched him when he was about – 14, 15 years old, and he's playing, uh, he's about 6'2", six, 6'3", six, playing as a freshman, sophomore in high school. He's probably about 150 pounds at that state, and uh, and he's he's throwing no-look passes. He's shooting from like 25 feet, and he was playing with some really good players. Like uh, one of his teammates, Austin Allen, was a, was a, a Nebraska football tight end who, uh, who's, who may end up in the NFL. Uh, another kid went to uh, play Division II college and was was a, an upperclassman on that team. So he was playing with some really good players, uh, but you could tell he just loved the limelight. He loved the moment. Uh, and as he got older, you know that never really changed. He he set passing records as a as a Nebraska high school quarterback. I think he threw 58 touchdown passes his senior year. Uh, he he very very easily could have been a, a high major Division One quarterback. Uh, but his, but basketball was his love, and it, it was uh, a little bit surprising. He committed very early in fall of his junior year. He went to South Dakota State. He wasn't getting a lot of recruiting buzz at that at that age. But uh, I think after a couple of years at SDSU, 
you know, the high majors were, you know, any, any high major coach looking for uh, sort of an efficient glue guy who could also, you know, be a, a big time scorer if you asked him to, you know, I think Baylor was on their radar. And, and, and what's, what's exciting about it from a coaching standpoint, I think, and, and Mike, you'd be able to, uh, to speak to this too, you know, he can just, he can kind of fill any role that you want him to fill. Uh, and I think he's, he's really going to thrive in that, in that regard at Creighton because, you know, it's a very versatile team. Uh, they, they got Trey Alexander and Arthur Kaluma and, and uh, you know, Nemhar, the point guard who was, who was all Big East freshman of the year and Ryan Kalkbrenner, uh, the, the seven footer in the middle, they've got a lot of talent, but they really need kind of a savvy, confident veteran and, and Baylor Shireman should fit that perfectly. Yeah, he, he really should. And he should fit into the, to the larger, broader mold for this team, right? There's a lot of versatility in this roster. There's a lot of depth in this roster. It's certainly one that, uh, Mike and I enjoyed covering throughout the season last year, certainly some of our favorite DFS plays. And, you know, now these Jays find themselves in a position that might be a little unfamiliar, right? There's there's some conversation about maybe even starting the preseason as high as a top five ranking. So how do you think Coach McDermott manages these increased expectations? And what's the general vibe or sense around the program for this coming season? Well, that's going to be a very interesting dynamic uh, because Creighton – you know, last year they they were picked eighth in the Big East to start the season, uh, and they made the NCAA tournament and, and made the second round and almost beat Kansas in the second round. Um, but they have struggled over the years at times when they when they felt the crush of of high expectations, and it's and there's been lots of different reasons for that. Most of them were injury related. Uh, they've they've often had injuries at the wrong times. Uh, you know, until they they made the Sweet Sixteen. Uh, about 14 months ago, you know, that was really a hurdle that they'd failed to, to overcome, even with Doug McDermott. So Creighton, you know, high expectations have been a challenge to them, uh, probably like they are in programs across the country that aren't the big time, you know, blue bloods. But I, I think, you know, this group is, is just uh, extremely talented. I think there's multiple NBA guys on this roster. Uh, and I think Creighton did, you know, learn something not only in, in this past season, getting to the second round of the NCAA tournament, but also kind of how they did it. And you guys, I'm sure, have noticed this over the years. But Creighton in the last two or three years has transitioned from sort of a soft finesse, uh, you know, let it fly was their mantra. And and they still like that identity. It's it's still partly what appealed to Baylor Shireman. But uh, they've also developed a grit and a toughness that you see with Alexander and Kaluma and Kalkbrenner uh, that has made them, I think, more, given them more potential in the postseason. It has allowed them to, to make deeper runs uh, in the Big East. You know, this is a team that, can, that is not afraid to, to, to defend in the last five minutes of a game. And, and that wasn't always the case with, with Doug McDermott and, and some of those teams over the last decade. Yeah, so you kind of mentioned uh, this roster, right? It's uh, pretty exciting being a college basketball fan, you know, watching what that freshman class did last year. You mentioned Kalkbrenner uh, being the defensive stalwart in a growing offensive game. So, you know, for me, between, you know, Trey Alexander, Arthur Kaluma, Ryan Nimhart, Kalkbrenner, is there an X factor on this team where we look back and, and say, like, this was the development that Creighton needed in order to kind of exceed or, you know, match expectations? Well, okay, so, you know, as you guys know, they played Kansas in the second round of the NCAA tournament without without Nemhard and without mm-hmm. Kalkbrenner, both of whom were injured. Uh, and, and there were times during that Kansas game when Arthur Kaluma looked like the best player on the court. Uh, and, and he's got a lot of versatility. You know, he can play small ball five if you want him to. He's, he's probably naturally, a, you know, a four or three even. Uh, but he's, he made a big jump, you know, at the very end of the year. And, and if he continues on that trajectory, you know, Creighton, Creighton will, uh, will very, you know, will, will fare very well and probably deserve to be, uh, in the top five or top 10. So I, I think Arthur Kaluma is the X factor for this team. Uh, obviously there's some other guys around him who are talented and have been injured the past year who they need those guys back too. But uh, but if you're asking opposing coaches, 
you know, who's the, who's, uh, who's the guy on that team? Uh, I think Arthur Kaluma is the name that you're going to hear the most often. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, certainly one of my favorites to, to track through the, the season last year. And while there is a, a ton to like about this roster, we're, we're also seeing something kind of unique, uh, at least in this point in time. And that is that we've got an absolute arms race in the Big East, right? So St. John's, uh, Providence are, are really loading up on some new talent. And you've obviously got the traditional powers there. So what are your thoughts on you know how Creighton handles the new environment of, of this Big East? Well, it's interesting, right? Because it's kind of a league with, with Jay Wright's retirement. Uh, I think it, it's a little bit to be determined who emerges as the, the new alpha dog. And maybe it's the old alpha dog and it's, it's Villanova. But I think there's, there's a little bit of a question about what the league looks like at the top over the next few years. And, uh, and nobody would have imagined five years ago that Creighton might step into that role. Uh, but Greg McDermott has, has done a really nice job loading up on talent. And he usually, you know, develops players as well as about anybody in the league. Uh, so I think there's there's a lot of questions at the top. Oh, I think we might have looks lost like him we, there for a second. Looks like we might have <laughs> lost lost Dirk there as uh, as he gets reconnected. Uh, Mike, you want to kind of finish out that yeah. thought and maybe give us a bit more of a picture on uh, on this revamp Big East? Yeah, I think he's right. Um, I mean. Who's going to kind of either take over that Jay Wright role, um, you know, in the head coaching department here in the Big East? And, you know, who's going to kind of step over Villanova here if anyone's going to? Uh, you know, I really like Creighton here, St. John's, as we get Dirk back in. Um, you know, just talking about, you know, who's that next coach that you think, uh, you know, you think Greg McDermott, uh, you know, can be that next Jay Wright type of, uh, you know, person to replace the Big East, uh, you know, top dogs here? Well, it's interesting. There was some chatter, uh, you know, in the past year that Greg McDermott, you know, might be looking around. Uh, he's he's been a hot name and in, insert in with certain jobs. You know, Ohio State probably most prominent a couple years ago. Uh, he was in the rumor mill at Arizona State here this last uh, six months, and there was a sense that maybe Greg McDermott, you know, was was looking for one last job. Uh, I think it's going to be hard to leave, you know, if he's got guys like Kaluma and Alexander coming in uh, and they might not be here very long, but it's, it's a pretty good indication of the talent pipeline that he's, dis he's established at Creighton. Uh, so, so, you know, I'm not saying he's going to be the guy, but from a pure talent standpoint, you know, I think Creighton right now can rank rank with about anybody. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that we love on this show, we love to talk about metrics, right? So, uh, you kind of hit it on the head earlier with Creighton being uh, a defensive stalwart last year, 19th in the nation in defensive efficiency. But we did see some offensive struggles, you know, ranking in the 300s and three-point shooting, turnover percentage. So do you think we see an adjustment in style of play, especially with Shireman coming over? Do you think there's guys like Francisco Farabello who's coming over from TCU, uh, you know, as a shooter? Mason Miller redshirted last year, can shoot from the outside. Do you think they're going to be counted on a little bit more? Do you think the style is going to, uh, you know, really reflect kind of what we saw last year? Well, you guys are are uh, are wise to point out the the metrics because they changed dramatically uh, this past year. And and Creighton, if you watched him in the Big East tournament, for instance, they played some ugly basketball uh, against Villanova. You know, they were they looked really good against Providence. They looked bad against Villanova, uh, and and they did turn the ball over too much. So I think the the, the solution, the silver bullet here is to try to find a way to sort of blend the old let it fly, you know, offensive perfection with uh, with the new defensive grit. And uh, I think Shireman will help in that regard quite a bit. Yeah, definitely uh, a bit of, a, of an interesting piece in terms of, uh, you know, how he fits in and, and how he potentially influences the, the style of play going forward. So we'll be watching that closely. Maybe, maybe zooming out a little bit here, Dirk, um, you know, curious, obviously, the transfer portal, the 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 advent of NIL, it's an entirely new landscape in, in college basketball. So would love to hear from you, you know, how how is NIL impacting this program? You know, are there are, are there any eight hundred thousand dollar contracts being handed out in Omaha or, um, you know, what does that market look like for for the Creighton players? Well, uh, Omaha is a basketball town. It's a football state, but it's a basketball town. And I think. 
you know, a lot of uh, the NIL, you know, the NIL collectives are emerging here as they are in, in various other places. We'll see if the NCA tries to put a kibosh on that or not. Uh, you know, Creighton's a private school with a pretty wealthy donor base. Uh, I think they'll be able to keep, you know, keep up with the Joneses if necessary. Maybe not to the degree that Kansas or Duke or Kentucky will. Uh, but I think Creighton is, you know, will be fairly well positioned in that regard to to go after players uh, if necessary. It's, uh, you know, I, I think the Big East is in a little bit of a bind when it comes to resources just because they're not going to have that football revenue mm-hmm. coming in that, that the Big Ten and the SEC have. So that's something to keep an eye on. But I think Creighton is going to be in a better position than most Big East schools. Absolutely. So final thing here, it's early May. Uh, we want to know, though, is this the year of the Blue Jay? And do we start buying our gear now or do we wait a little bit and play a wait and see approach? What are your thoughts? Well, you know, Creighton's had a lot of bad luck uh, <laughs> in, the, in the second half of seasons over the last 10 years. So, so I think you can buy those T-shirts, but do it with a little bit of uh, reluctance or maybe hedge your bets because, uh, you know, sometimes things fall apart for this program in, in February and March. Fair, fair enough. will certainly be a fun ride between now and then. Once again, Dirk Chatlin, thank you very much for spending some time with us. Uh, for anyone out there that is tuned in, definitely get over there to Twitter at Dirk Chatlin or read all of his great work at Omaha.com. Uh, no one that I have come across is as plugged into this program. So definitely appreciate you spending some time with us and from filling us in on everything that's going on with the Jays. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Dirk. Thanks, Dirk. So, Mike, we mentioned off the top that Shireman himself, I believe, was number two on your big board. Um, And now that we've got a few more days under our belt in this transfer portal window, We've got several other top 10 players that are making their decision. Why don't you kick us off with your number seven player? Yeah, so we saw our guy K.J. Williams from Murray State. Um, LSU, right? Uh, big surprise. Uh, head coach uh, Matt Mc, uh, Mac, 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 McCann um, moved over to LSU. Uh, obviously brought along Justice Hill, who was our number 44 ranked player, and Trey Hannibal with him. Yeah, this is starting to look like a pretty good team after the loss of uh, Will Wade here, um, and the entire team seemed to fit, uh, go into the transfer portal. You know, now we're seeing LSU bring in the Murray State talent, who uh, obviously was a, a really stout team last year, and now you bring over the Ohio Valley Player of the Year in KJ Williams. Uh, for me, you know, KJ is that guy where we talk about the mid majors, right? And they're kind of littered all over the top of our board, right? The question is, how do these guys transition when they get into SEC and they get into the Big East, when they get into the Big Twelve? You know, with the style of play, K.J. Williams' body type, I feel like he's a little more equipped um, with his inside-outside game uh, to kind of look past those struggles and kind of work through those as he gets into the conference play. So, obviously, this is a huge get. Anytime you land someone inside the top ten, especially in these uh, th- these days with the transfer portal and, you know, how many really good players are, are in this thing nowadays. So, uh, I think for me, obviously, we're going to be, uh, for a D- DFS perspective, we're going to be playing a lot of him. Um, you know, he kind of slots right into that role. Darius Day is that Tari Eason type role. Uh, you know, he's going to have play that traditional role where he, uh, he's going to get touches inside. He's going to get touches outside. And, uh, yeah, I expect to uh, see him put up, uh, you know, gaudy numbers and challenge for a double-double on a nightly basis. And uh, I'm just really looking forward to seeing him play on the big stage here. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to watch, right? Um, you know, n- not surprising to see – uh, Williams and a bunch of other Murray State talent make their way to to the Bayou and and you know suit up for uh, for these Tigers. I mean, on the whole, this is a team in transition, right? Uh, you you mentioned new coach. Essentially, all of their existing players jumped in the portal. Um, they they lost the vast majority of them. They've got a few people returning. So there's there's going to be a lot of question marks around who this team is. I guess from a from a DFS perspective, uh, and I I want you to check me on this logic. It would seem to me like the guys that came in from Murray State are the ones that are going to have the shortest learning curve adapting to this LSU game, right? Um, is is that is that kind of how you're you're thinking about it? Are they going to be the priorities for this LSU team in the early parts of next season? Yeah, you have to think so, right? I mean, Mac Mahan, he's going to obviously put the ball on the players that he trusts, right? And he's had seasons with 
uh, Hill, Hannibal, and obviously uh, KJ uh, Williams. And, you know, they've <laughs> taken him to the tournament, so he trusts those guys, right? So I think you're going to see him lean um, on these guys early and often. And, uh, yeah, they're no slouches either. So, uh, you know, obviously being a top 10 player in the portal, you know, KJ Williams, uh, you know, should be that guy that they go to early and often. And uh, I'm just really excited to see him play in the SEC. So I think from a DFS perspective, all three of these guys are going to be guys that we're going to be using a lot. Um, I think as a, from a macro perspective, it makes LSU worthy of, uh, you know, the middle of the pack uh, with the potential to, you know, maybe get towards the top, depending on how this team blends, uh, you know, how else this roster comes together. So uh, just kind of exciting times after, uh, you know, after the loss of Will Wade and, and uh, you know, seeing them, uh, you know, turn this roster over. Yeah, definitely a program in transition and a program to watch. Uh, another transition is a high upside guard heading out west to play for the Fighting Phil Knights. I mean, Oregon Ducks. Uh, why don't you tell us about their latest edition? Yeah, so I got Jermaine Cuisnard, uh, 35th ranked transfer in our top 100 board on drreto.com, taking his talents out to uh, Oregon, playing for the Ducks here. So, man, uh, we watched him play last year at South Carolina. You know, Frank Martin had uh, the most ridiculous system. Felt like uh, he's pretty much just plugging and playing everybody 18 minutes. <laughs> so, um, you know, when we saw him have some monster games uh, against LSU, I think he dropped 33 points against them, had some other big games. When he got 30 to 35 minutes, he was a super productive player. Dana Altman, um, with the loss of Jacob Young, you know, Davion Harmon, uh, they lost Will Richardson, you know, Dana Altman likes to play with guards. So he's going to pair up here with uh, Colorado transfer Keyshawn Bartholomew. Um, who is a, a nice guard out there for Colorado and, you know, bring some experience in the Pac-12. So, you know, these two guys together kind of give him two of the three pieces that he's kind of looking forward to to make his three-guard uh, backcourt work here. And, uh, yeah, they could be uh, kind of sneaky in the Pac-12. Um, you know, this hasn't been, we haven't talked much about the Pac-12, right? Uh, it's been pretty heavy with the Big East, uh, you know, obviously diving into the SEC um, and some of these other, you know, big boy conferences here. But, uh, you know, the Pac-12 seems like every year they're kind of overlooked. But, uh, you know, Oregon landing these two guards, uh, definitely going to put them in the mix. And we'll just kind of see what happens um, as the rest of the roster comes together. So uh, what are your thoughts on on the addition here? And, um, yeah, what are, your, what are your thoughts on Oregon and the Pac-12? Yeah, it's a – it's a good shout. Um, it, it feels like uh, we fall right into that kind of East Coast media bias, even though we're not on the East Coast. Um, we definitely don't talk about these West Coast teams quite as much. Um, it probably has to do with what slates these teams are on and, and where the car is. I, I, I had anything along those lines. I mean, how much how much money is Phil not spending on, on an AO right now? Is there anything reported out there, or is he just sticking to, like, paying for all the facilities and letting somebody else cut the check. <laughs> no, I, I think he's, uh, he's making those offers out there. Right. So, um, you know, Oregon's making a splash, obviously in the, when you look at college football, there's been some rumors out there. Um, definitely not on my list as uh, you see the uh, burn orange and white back here trying to take our best receiver. Um, but yeah, I think obviously having Nike backing, we talk about NIL, it's going to be huge here in the next few years. So we'll kind of see how they play with that and, you know, if they're able to you know, turn some of these big time transfers and big time high school prospects, uh, you know, over to the West Coast. So that's something to obviously pay attention to. I think when you're looking at next year, obviously bringing in the two guards here, uh, you know, and some of the roster back, uh, you know, Quincy Guerrier is uh, coming back here. A really nice forward that transferred over from Syracuse uh, the year before. and uh, Didn't quite find his footing, but I'm expecting bigger things from him. So nice little core roster that they're building here in Oregon and uh, definitely excited to see, uh, you know, how the rest of it turns out. For sure. And, you know, <clears throat> moving on, one of our one of our, our pillars, our core principles here at the One and Done Show is that we we seek feedback and we immediately activate on it. And so with that, Let's actually keep talking about this, these West Coast teams, these Pac-12 teams. We've got another team that disappointed a little bit, but has quietly been stacking up some pretty nice pieces in the Arizona State Sun Devils. So why, don't, why don't you tell us about all of the moves that they've made this offseason? Yeah, so Arizona State, you know, 14 and 17 last year, 10 and 10 uh, in the Pac-12 disappointing right uh the year before a little bit disappointing obviously you have remy martin transfer out of there last year goes to kansas wins the national championship so it's really a punch in the gut right but uh 
Yeah, man, one of the most underrated off seasons going on right now. I mean, you get the the transfer from both brothers here, the Cambridge brothers. You get Nevada uh, guard here, Desmond Cambridge, who is number thirty six on our transfer portal board. A really, really good scorer, and you get his brother, who was kind of buried at Auburn behind the two bigs, and you know Kessler and Jabari Smith. You know, only averaged five points a game, uh, more of a role yeah. player there. But uh, you expect him to get some more opportunity here, and you know if he uh, if he gets you know twenty five to thirty minutes, he could be someone that really breaks out. Uh, definitely got a lot of upside there. So, uh, you know, I like the way the roster's coming together here. Um, they also snagged De- uh, Desmond Cambridge's teammate Warren Washington from Nevada. Uh, really good uh, shot blocker. Averaged uh, almost 11 points a game last year. He's a good screen and roll big. Got a little bit of versatility to him. Doesn't really have that outside game, but uh, uh, definitely someone that uh, you know can eat up space, clog the paint, grab some boards, and uh, set picks for you know Desmond Cambridge. And you know our guy coming back here, DJ Horn, who we played a lot of in DFS last year, uh, really kind of broke out. Um, you know, 12 and a half points a game. Really showed some explosiveness, getting to the bucket, uh, shooting from the outside. So. Man, you start to look at this roster and you're like, man, if the pieces start to fit and you're able to make this thing work, it's pretty exciting. And then we just got news yesterday that Frankie Collins of Michigan transfer coming on over to to play here. So we'll see what kind of role he's going to play, whether he's going to come off the bench, whether they decide to go, uh, you know, with more of a two, you know, maybe a three guard rotation in the starting lineup. Uh, but we saw Frankie Collins in the tournament uh, when the, when Devontae Jones was out uh, against Colorado State, uh, a really nice game. And then, uh, you know, obviously uh, Jones came back and kind of took over that point guard duties from there. So uh, obviously Collins looking for some uh, greener grass here. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, he's definitely an exciting addition. You know, these aren't quite top 100 players. When we start getting to the 100s, I mean, really, you know, 100 through 150, 200 are going to be a little interchangeable. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where I see Washington, Collins, uh, even a Devin Cambridge. So uh, just kind of a nice offseason so far. Uh, any thoughts on Arizona State? Yeah, a, a few. Um, on a lighter note, um, I I love seeing the the Cambridge brothers uh, suiting up for this team. It feels like now that there's, you know, we're, we're in this age of player movement. We're seeing a lot more family affairs and, and brothers mm-hmm. teaming up on teams. So Going uh, home. definitely <laughs> – yeah, definitely a lot of fun to watch just from a storyline standpoint. Um, you know, specifically for the outlook for for the Sun Devils. I mean, in in the example you were giving, you know, really lies the the the, the key here, right? Like they've added a ton of really solid players, a bit more of the volume play, but that depth is critical, right? Uh, we talk about their loss in Remy Martin, right? If one of these guys becomes that type of first man off the bench producer, they're in a really good position, right? If they uh, you know, eventually battle with injury, which seems to be the case uh, as we get closer into March, they've got guys that have the pedigree and that are, you know, big time recruits and have some, some good college minutes under their belt to contribute, you know, if and when injury strikes this team. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a bit of, bit of a question mark as we head into the season uh, in terms of you know how the rotation you know shakes out and who's going to get you know ball handling responsibility and who's going to get more run and more minutes, but ultimately there are a lot of guys that can really contribute. I guess to that to that last thought, you know if if you had to throw a throw a dart at kind of who's got the inside track to really step step up out of these um, you know out of these most recent additions, who do you see playing a bigger role earlier in the season? Yeah, I think Desmond Cambridge is going to be critical um, to how their season's going to go. Uh, you know, he's going to give them that lead scorer, uh, someone that can create. Uh, you know, I really love his game. He's one of my favorite players. I probably have him rated higher than a lot of other places have him. I'm uh, just having watched him, uh, definitely a lethal scorer here. So I'm interested to see, you know, how they're going to use him. I think the X factor, though, um, you know, is going to be what's going to happen with Marcus Bagley. Uh, I mean, a top 25 type recruit just battled injuries the last couple of years when he was healthy, man, he was, uh, you know, doing some, doing some nice things early in his career. So, you know, the expectation is it, it's that he's coming back. If he's healthy, they could be pretty dangerous. If he's anywhere near the the level of player that, uh, you know, he's capable of being, man, uh, they're going to be an exciting team. If uh, they can put all the pieces together and get these guys going and, and really work out these rotations and, 
uh, you know, we're, we're going to see them kind of rise to the top if, uh, you know, they can stay healthy and, and, and make it all fit. So uh, definitely exciting times for them. And I continue to look forward to what they're, uh, you know, how they're going to finish out uh, this roster here. Yeah, that is certainly for sure the case. As we wrap up here, Mike, a few more news and notes items. We have uh, another player from your big board that has decided where they are going, another one with decisions to come. So let's fill everyone in on those latest pieces of news and maybe a little bit about what you're looking to learn as we head into the weekend. Yeah, so right state forward, uh, Grant Basau uh, picked Virginia Tech. He's number 77 on our board. Man, super skilled offensive big man, averaged 18 points, nine rebounds, played with Tanner Holden um, on that really fun Wright State team uh, that a lot of people saw in that play-in game. So uh, definitely going to help ease the blow. Uh, Kive Luma, someone that we played a lot in DFS, and Justin Mutz is obviously still deciding if he's going pro or if he's coming back. So both of those guys were monster front court players. We saw them uh, take down Duke in the ACC uh, tournament title game. So you know, two big losses that both those guys head off to the NBA, but, uh, you know, bringing in a, a guy of this caliber that can play on the block, uh, you know, definitely going to help soften the blow here. And then our 25th ranked player, Antoine Davis, uh, man, absolute bucket getter. Um, averaged almost 24 points per game last year. Interesting finalist, right? He's got Maryland, Kansas State, Georgetown, BYU, and Detroit. So, you know, I'm looking at Kansas State. Uh, and it would be super exciting to see him play up for Patrick Ewing. I think uh, that Georgetown offense, we know that pace would be super nice. But, uh, you know, if I had to pick a favorite right now, it's looking like Kansas State. I think we're going to get that decision on Monday. And there's going to be plenty of decisions happening, um, to, you know, with fourteen hundred over 1,400 guys in the portal. Uh, there's going to be more and more decisions being made. We're going to see a lot of those uh, starting tomorrow. We're going to see a lot on Monday. Uh, so these rosters are really starting to round and take form. So uh, any thoughts as we kind of head into the weekend? I mean, really, my my closing thoughts, there are several players that have announced they will be making their decision and announcing their decision over the next couple of days. So this news is going to continue to come at us fast and furious. If you are wanting to stay on top of all of it, got a couple pieces of homework for you. First, if you're not already doing so, get over to Twitter at MC Holland 34 hit that follow button. If you're feeling spicy, hit that notification button. Mike is keeping track of every little crumb of news is going around out there. And then head over to drroto.com, get yourself signed up, get into our members only discord, and you will see not only that breaking news that Mike is tracking, but also his thoughts and his compilation of how these players fall into the ranks of the free agents. And the last thing to do before we get out of here is let's get this bread. Thanks for stopping by the office. Get your fantasy prescription by subscribing to the channel and checking out drrodo.com. And until the next visit, be well and take care.